How many of you know that God has been good? Well, we're going to share a message with you in just a minute, but this is my beautiful wife, Vanessa. My name is Mike. This is one of the reasons I know God is good. So in just a minute, we're going to share a message that we know that God put on our hearts, but babe, I think you want to take a moment and pray us into this moment, really invite the Holy Spirit to help us. Yes, God, we just thank you. And just like we were singing, you have been so good to us, God. And we just take this moment to acknowledge all the good things you've done for us. And we thank you, Lord, for all the good things you're going to do for us, Lord. So we just welcome you here this evening. We acknowledge you. We're here to hear from you, God. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. So, my name is Mike. This is Vanessa. You want this side? Yeah, this is my seat. Oh, this is your side. Okay. And we we're going to share a message with you guys. You know, uh, last year the planning team was getting together. They were saying, okay, looks like Valentine's Day is going to fall on a Wednesday. So, Mike and Vanessa, you're up. Which is great because we are the newest married couple and we obviously have years of experience as a married couple to draw on. A whole one year. One year, five, five months. months. Anybody here less than a year married? Anybody like that? All right. Good. Awesome. This is the best year ever. And we're going to share a message that actually has nothing to do with Valentine's Day, <laughs> but it has everything to do with the greatest love story ever told. You know, some of us, I know at this time, I, as a single man for many years, I was single for quite some time and very familiar with Single Awareness Day or Valentine's, <laughs> but this is something that I really want to highlight as we share as a married couple today, that this is a promise fulfilled from God, that this is one of the visible demonstrations to me of how much God really, truly loves me and loves the world and loves the people in this room. And we're going to share tonight about how important it is for us to remember that that love does not ever run out. That the love of God, the grace of God, the mercy of God, it, it never leaves. It's always available. And you might have walked in tonight in bad shape. You might have walked in tonight knowing that you've gone a little too far, you disqualified yourself, you made a fool of yourself, but we're here to tell you that there is a God who loves you exactly where you are, and he knew that this day was coming. So, um, I'm excited. I want to first start. How many of you know that we have the greatest pastors in the world? <laughs> Pastor Marco, Pastor Lisa, we love you guys. I, I wish I could be as funny as Pastor. He was preaching to the Valentine's uh, dinner on Monday talking about the super love man. And, I mean, if you missed it, I'm sorry. I'm not going to be that funny, but we're, we're going to try our best. preparing, I kept trying to throw some <laughs> Pastor Marco jokes in, and it's like, it's just, I, I can't do it. I said, <laughs> babe, you, you can't do that joke. Only Pastor can do that joke. But would you give it up one more time for our pastors? They're amazing. We love them. They're awesome. So God definitely gave us a message tonight we want to share with you guys. As I mentioned, this is something that I believe that really um, just God spoke to both of us individually as we were preparing over the last few weeks. We've been fasting. We've been praying. And this is the thing that the title of our message tonight is, You Didn't Miss the Call. You didn't miss the call. Now, we were joking about this earlier. You know, those moments where you're on the phone with a customer service. Now, you're, babe, at the office, you're I'm like I'm always that on the phone. And so if you've ever called Spectrum or anyone and they're like, you're number 68 in line, but if you give me your phone number, we'll call you back and you won't lose your spot in line. So you're waiting for it. And then you what happens the when you miss the call? You feel really bad. Yes. You, you feel, feel like, oh, no, bad. this is horrible. But tonight, this is the opposite experience you're going to have because we want you to know you didn't miss the call. Someone say... The call. You didn't miss it. Look at Romans eleven twenty nine. 29. This is a, our foundational verse tonight. It has something really interesting to share with you. For God's gifts and his call are irrevocable. Now that word call is from the Greek word klesis. It actually has two definitions that are pretty, pretty key to what we're going to talk about tonight. The first is a divine invitation to embrace salvation in the kingdom of God. Oh my goodness, I could stop right there. The call of God, 
The salvation that he has invited you to is without repentance, without, it is not ever going to leave. He's always calling you to salvation. But get this part, the second part of this definition is that it's also someone whom God calls and declares worthy to obtain the promised blessings attached to that call. So the invitation tonight is to salvation and the promised blessings that stands for everybody in this room. Tonight, there's someone in here tonight that's going to say yes to that call for the first time tonight. I want you to know that you're here for a reason, that God gave us this message for you, that you're going to be the one that says yes tonight to that call of God, to salvation and to the promised life that he's had for you. Right, but there's something to note about this, that this amazing call of God is something that he makes work. He makes it happen. And sometimes we feel like, oh, man, I missed it. Or sometimes we may disqualify ourselves or feel like, you know, it sounds too good to be true. Well, we just have to remember that this is not something that we make happen on our own, right. but it's something that God makes happen. And so the main point that we want to hit tonight is that the call of God is irrevocable. What does that mean? It means it's not taken away. And so your doubts, your failures, all the delays, it doesn't change it. You're still loved. You're still called by God. The promise still stands. And again, you didn't miss the call. Right. And this brings to mind a story that really just for my own life, guys, this is exactly how I felt when I walked through the doors like probably some of you tonight. I was a mess. I was in a sexual immoral relationship. I was a drug abuser, an alcohol abuser. I was actually on trial for assault because I was totally controlled by a spirit of rage and anger. So many times I got in fights without even knowing it, found myself locked up literally at the handcuffs on a curb. They're saying, did you know what you did? And I'm literally saying, I don't. I don't know what I did because my life was out of control. That's the way that I walked into church one day. It was 2007. I had come to the end of myself and I was finally at a point where I wanted to change, but I wasn't quite, quite ready. And I remember coming in and kind of sitting in judgment, like, can I trust these people? Do they really have my best at heart? Do I, do I think I'm in a safe place? And I remember a pastor, and I'm going to stand for this part, but he stood up. He said he wasn't going to stand. I, <laughs> there he goes. <laughs> I, I stood, he stood at the front of a platform, and he read this verse that, for me, I had heard before because I'd been raised in church, but I'd never heard it like I heard it that day. And I, I think it's a verse for some of you in this room. It's Roman, excuse me, Jeremiah 29, 11. It says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. And when he spoke those words, something shifted inside of my heart. Because I knew the call of God that had been on my life since I was a little boy was for my best. That he wasn't calling me to a less than life. He wasn't calling me to live a life that would have been a plan B or a plan C or some other life that I didn't want to live. But it was the very life that I'd been longing to live and I'd been running from it for 10 years. And so in a moment of worship, just like we just had, I raised my hands and I said, Jesus, I surrender my life to you. I want to live that plan. I want to live the good plan that you have for my life. And I'll tell you what happened, and it's going to happen to some of you in this place tonight. The love of God surrounded me in such a real way that I could not deny that he was real, that he was there, that his love was so far beyond anything I could ever imagine. And the crazy thing was, I knew who I was. I knew I didn't deserve it. I knew I was still on trial for assault, that I was still living with my girlfriend, that I was a drug addict and an alcoholic, and there was nothing in my life that deserved that kind of love. But guys, it didn't stop there. Because in the middle of that amazing moment, I heard God's voice, not audibly, but in my heart, say, the plan has not changed. So you may have walked into this church tonight like I did, thinking that you'd gone too far. Thinking that you'd done too much, that your hopes and dreams would need to be adjusted. But God has been waiting to meet you here. No matter how many times you fail, 
no matter how far you strayed away, no matter how many times you ran in the opposite direction, no matter how dead your dreams of a great future might look, God has not been caught off guard by your mistakes. He saw the end from the beginning, and he has still, that call of God on your life, it's irrevocable. It can't be taken away. He's calling you to life. He's calling you to purpose. He's calling you to a prosperous life that you've longed to live. Amen. So with that being said, thanks, babe. That was powerful. Now I feel like I need to stand up and shout and Go preach. ahead and shout, girl. I'm going to teach today. <laughs> All right. So tonight we're actually going to look at the life of Abraham. And Abraham is someone who kept hoping when there was no reason for hope. There, right. He was someone who kept believing in spite of failures and in, despite of um, uh, disappointment, delays. delays, thank mm -hmm. you, frustration. But he's also someone who saw a God promise fulfilled in his life because he continued to trust in God. Right. And so Romans 4.18 says, even when there was no reason for hope, Abraham kept hoping, believing that he would become the father of many nations. For God had said to him, that's how many descendants you will have. Mm. It says here, even when there was no reason for hope, Abraham kept hoping, believing. And maybe some of you tonight are here like Abraham. Life has come and it's, it's stolen any good reason for you to hope. The circumstances, it doesn't look like there's a reason to hope. Or right. maybe you felt like Mike and even myself feeling like maybe you've gone too far. Mm -hmm. There can't be a good promise. What God has called me to do, I, I, it's, it's, it's done. I, it's not going to happen. Well, I'm here to tell you, don't worry. Don't worry. You didn't miss the call. Right. <laughs> so let's take a look at Abraham's call, okay? Genesis 17, 4 through 5, this is God speaking to Abraham. This is my covenant with you. I will make you the father of a multitude of nations. What's more, I am changing your name. It will no longer be Abram. Instead, you will be called Abraham, for you will be the father of many nations. Now, there's so much in that. I love, first of all, that God is changing his name. And I could preach a whole sermon about how some of you are going to have a new identity yes. as you walk out the doors tonight. Yes. But I want to focus just for a moment on the promise, because this word covenant is super deep. The word covenant is the Hebrew word bereath, and it means a divine order, decree, or promise. In other words, it's a God yes. promise. Someone say God promise. God promise. I mention that and I emphasize that because a God promise cannot be changed. God never changes his word. He never changes his mind. His promise stands forever. And so when God gives you a promise, that is something you can count on, you can believe in, and you can hope on. From the first moment that God called Abraham, he made him this promise. Yeah. You will be the father of many nations. So we see God's call and his promise to Abraham, and it gets repeated a lot. It gets repeated like half a dozen times throughout Scripture. Remember, when it comes to God's call, that it can't be taken away. And over and over again, God tells Abraham, you can count on me. If you walk with me, I'm going to make you great. Yeah. But there was a long journey right. ahead of Abraham, right? From the moment of that first call until he finally saw its fulfillment, there was a very long journey. And like Abraham, each of us here tonight has a choice to say yes to the call of God or to walk out the doors just like we came in. Right. You have a choice tonight to say yes to the call of God and believe that he will make good on his promise or say forget it, this is just taking too long. You have a choice tonight to hope in God, his call, his promise, even when there's no reason to hope just as Abraham did. Now we love the life of Abraham because frankly it's full of mistakes. <laughs> It's full of mistakes and doubts and seeming delays just like both of our lives, just like I think a lot of the lives in this room. We've had some mistakes. We've had some times of doubt. We've had some delays in our faith. But guess what? None of those things stopped Abraham. Right, right. So there are plenty of things in Abraham's life that try to steal his hope, try to cause him to give up on the promise or tempt him to stop believing and what we're going we're gonna to go over those things because we might be able to identify some of those things in our own lives. Right. And tonight what we're calling those or what we're identifying are hope stillers. Okay, so the things that try to still our hope when God gives us a promise. And so hope stiller number one, unbelief. Mm. 
Yeah, we all can, we all can relate to that one. Mm-hmm. Genesis 17, 17 says, Then Abraham bowed down to the ground, but he laughed to himself in disbelief. How could I become a father at the age of 100, he thought. And how can Sarah have a baby when she's 90 years old? <laughs> That's how I think he said it, like, what? <laughs> like, I think he's like, this just doesn't make sense. Like, this is impossible. I don't know how this is going to happen. Almost like, you're, you're playing a joke on me, Lord. And I think many of us can relate to that. God may speak something in our lives and we may think that is, that's good for so-and-so. I can see you doing that in so-and-so's life, but for me, that doesn't make sense. Do you know what family I come from or again, what I've done or all these unbeliefs, but we have to know that um, God really does have good plans for us. And so I want to share a story about just this, this unbelief that we face. And this is from when I was about 10 years old, maybe a little younger, I remember one of the biggest fears that I had was a fear of raising kids alone. And so I'm a little girl and I'm meditating on this thought of, how am I gonna take my kids to school? How, I gotta get a job where I'm gonna be able to be out on time to pick them up from school. I need to make this much an hour so that way I can provide for them. And I remember, again, I'm going to reiterate, I was a little girl and I was at my friend's house having this conversation with her. I'm discussing how stressed out I was to to be a mom. And her mom walks in and she says, what are you talking about? She's like, you're going to be married. You're going to have a husband to help you. Speak that, Lord. Thank you. (laughs) And I remember like a light bulb went off in my head because I was like, I never thought about that. Like, that wasn't the vision I had for my life. Like, I didn't, I knew, I seen marriages and I know God has good plans, we hear that, but I didn't, I didn't believe that God was gonna send me a husband to help me with the kids and pay bills. No, just kidding. <laughs> but we all, we can fall into that if we're honest. There could be things in our lives that we're, that we just don't believe or almost that we're uh, afraid to believe because we don't want to get our expectations up and be disappointed because maybe people have disappointed us in our life. And this is a scripture that like just just helps me with that. I want to share with you because Isaiah 49, 28 says, those who put their hope in the Lord will not be disappointed. Yeah, that's good. Super good. So when we recognize that we have some unbelief or disbelief in our life or in our hearts, it's really important that we react the way that this doubting father did in Mark chapter 9. In Mark chapter 9, a father who is desperate for his son to be healed comes to Jesus, and he begs Jesus to heal him. And and in this begging, Jesus notices there might be some unbelief here because he comes to Jesus and he says, if you can... And Jesus kind of responds with, wait a minute, that's, that's just silly. And listen to what Jesus said in Mark chapter 9, 23 and 24. What do you mean, if I can? Jesus asked, anything is possible if a person believes. And the Father has such a beautiful response here. He instantly cried out, I do believe, but help me overcome my unbelief. And this is the point. When you recognize there's unbelief in your life, when you recognize you've been seeing things and thinking of your future in the wrong way, that you haven't believed that God had a good plan for your life, or that you'd gone too far and disqualified yourself from that plan and it no longer applies to you, whatever the source of that unbelief is, you need to go to Jesus like this Father and say, help me in my unbelief. I want to believe. Don't let this unbelief stay in my heart, God. Help me to believe. Now, there's another hope stealer. That first one was unbelief. The second one is delay. Someone say delay. Delay. This one is one I feel like I know a little bit about. Michael is excited to share this story. (laughs) Someone give him a gold star for this Let me go to Abraham first before we jump into my story. Abraham was 75 years old when God first spoke to him and commanded him to go to Canaan, the promised land, and promised him a son with many descendants. So he's 75 years old. Now, he waits 25 years for his promise to come to pass. Now, that's a long delay. 
But these delays are going to come to all of our lives, okay? Everybody in here, no matter how, many, how spiritually mature you are, no matter how long you've been walking with God, no matter how powerful and amazing you are, there will be some delays in your life. And some of those are going to be harder to understand than others. You know, we actually read in our daily growth book, this is from Sunday's reading. This is Matthew chapter 11, verses 2 and 3. It's John the Baptist Now, John the Baptist, Jesus actually describes him in the same chapter as one of the greatest prophets of all time. He's actually like praising John because he has such amazing faith and power and authority. And John's actually the one, the first one ever to identify Jesus as the Messiah. But something takes place in John's life. He goes and he actually condemns the Roman rulers for the sin in their life. One of the Roman rulers had actually seduced another man's wife and brought her to his home. And so John goes and says, that's sinful. You can't do that. And the results are that John gets thrown in prison. When John's in prison, time goes by. He's in that prison for quite a while. And finally, he gets to a point where he's like, this is taking a really long time. And that's where we pick up this story in verse 2. It says, John the Baptist, who was in prison, heard about all the things the Messiah was doing, so he sent his disciples to ask Jesus, are you the Messiah we've been expecting, or should we keep looking for someone else? What? You're the one who identified he's the Messiah. How can this doubt be there? And I'm telling you, this happens to the most powerful people in all of Christianity. They get to these point where the delay has just been too much. John's like, hey, I'm in a Roman prison. You were supposed to come establish the kingdom of heaven here and overturn all these rulers and leave this, leave this, so we can leave this life behind. But I'm still stuck here. You know, this reminds me of a verse that I often had to quote myself as a single man. 2 Peter 3, 9, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise. Sometimes it feels like God is so slow, but he's not slow. It says, as The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. I, I love this verse because, first of all, it speaks to that same call we're talking about. God's call of salvation is still here. It's available. He wants you to be saved. He's giving you grace to come and say, yes, I want to follow Jesus. Yes, I want to have a moment like Mike and surrender. But sometimes it feels like it's, it's taking a long time, God, for the promise to come, for that life abundant you said would come with that surrender, for that next level of growth or whatever it is you're waiting for. Maybe you're waiting for a promise of a child. Maybe you're waiting for the promise of that husband or wife. Maybe you're waiting for the promised ministry that you know you're called to. And you're saying, man, this promise is taking a long time. But God's not slow in keeping his promises. He's waiting for just the right moment. I was, two, I was, I won't go to my age, but 2007, when I dedicated, rededicated my life to the Lord, and I was a mess, like I said, a total basket case. I was jacked up, as they say, and it took a while for me to let God transform my life and to begin to work on some of my inner character issues and help me get past some of those those anger issues and the sexual morality and all the soul ties that I had. And I did feel like God was at work, especially in the early part of my walk with God. And I knew that I wasn't quite ready for like a marriage yet, you know? Like basically when we first started out, I was just like, hey, Mike, can you, can you be like sexually pure for even a week? Like that's where we started. And finally, after a couple years, I realized like God's really been at work here. And so I started asking and praying, God, when... Are you going to send Mrs. Wright? When are you going to send my wife? Now, that was a long time ago, guys. When I started that prayer, probably 2008, 2009, I was, I was thinking I was pretty patient. 2010 came, 2011 came. You know those really, like, super religious things we say, whatever the Lord wants, brother. I had those moments. I had moments where I was like, well, God, if you don't want me to get married, I understand. Like that, that was 2015. You start telling yourself, I was born to be single. Yeah, yeah of course. Yeah, I, you know what? I think I can do this. I think Paul did it. I can do this. I can do this. Now, I'm embarrassed to say that when I was like five or six years old, I can remember going to elementary school, like first grade with my grandma, and praying for my wife. 
That's like, sweet. we were praying for my wife. She wasn't on the planet yet, but <laughs> we were praying for her. So I, I always kind of knew, like, I'm going to be married someday, but this delay got so long that I started to wonder. Right. 2017, that's 10 years, y'all. Right. <laughs> 2017, I'm like, okay. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise. 18, 19, 20, all those days went by. You know, and, and the Bible talks about what this can do to us sometimes. In Proverbs 13, 12, it says, hope deferred makes the heart sick. So there's times where I was literally just fed up and angry with God at the delay. And I remember so many angry prayers at him and the negotiations right. and if you do this, if you bring her then, and all those different moments in my life. But I'll tell you what, all that time, that 15 years or so that I waited was well worth the wait. Yeah. And I'll tell you this, I wasn't waiting for God to fix her. I was in a process that God had to take me through so that I would be prepared to love and appreciate and be grateful for the promise that he had for me. I'll tell you what, I, there's not a day I don't wake up that I don't thank God for my beautiful wife and the marriage she's given me, a marriage with purpose, a marriage where we get to touch lives and see people brought into the kingdom. There are so many times where I get to experience the end of this verse, the heart sick, but a dream fulfilled, it's a tree of life. If you can wait, if you'll fight through those delays, if you'll continue to believe, even in the face of circumstances that don't make sense, if you'll say, I don't care how long it takes, I'm trusting God. If you'll just hold on to that promise, I'll tell you what, God will do miracles. Yeah, yeah. and when we were talking about this, one of the things you mentioned is that you believed that it was your failures that was causing Absolutely. this de delay. Yes. Mm -hmm. And that takes us into hope stiller number three, failure. Right. Has anyone ever failed at something in your life? Oh, Anything? Yeah. Me. And so let's look at Genesis 16, verses 3 through 4. It says, so after Abram had been, give, had been living in Canaan 10 years, Sarai, his wife, took her Egyptian slave, Hagar, and gave her to her husband to be his wife. He slept with Hagar, and she conceived. This was one of Abraham's biggest failures. He gave up on the promise and tried to take matters into his own hands. Can anyone relate to that? God speaks a word, you know there's a promise, there's a delay, it's not happening as quickly as you thought it was gonna happen, so you say, you know what, maybe if I do this, this is what God wants me to do. Let me do this, A, B, and C, and make this work out. Mm. But that's not what happened here. Abraham realized that, hey, this was a mistake. And then he believed that he had to go with plan B. And, and that's what happens oftentimes in our lives is we make mistakes, we have failures, and like I believed um, with just unbelief thinking like, okay, like I can't have God's best. And so I remember, just want to share this story with you, I remember um, I was about 14 years old and was actually with, with the Way World Outreach, I um, did the purity ceremony uh, uh, at the Fox Theater. And I was extremely excited. This was not something that I took lightly. I knew that this was a commitment I wanted to make. Um, I believed that if I kept this commitment, that then I was going to get God's best for my life. And so when I made this commitment, years later, I broke it. And you could imagine what I felt. I felt uh, shameful, I felt guilty, I felt, but most importantly what I felt, I felt that like anything good God had for me, any plan he had for me, that I forfeited it because I didn't keep this promise. I made this huge failure. And, and I know I, I, this is something I'm passionate about because I lived in that for 10 years before I came back to God. Because wow. I, was, I was so ashamed. And, and what I wanted to share here is that that's what the enemy does to us. When he sees our failures, he tells us, you've, you've gone too far this time. You, you're now disqualified. You've done too much for God to use you. I didn't believe God could use me at all. You're stuck here. This is what you deserve. And here's a lie that, that I think the world says, we even hear it. You made your bed, now you have to lay in it. Wow. And this is what I want to say is, sin is not your only option. 
If you make a mistake, you make a failure, you don't have to remain in that. You don't have to believe the lie that I did this, now I'm stuck here. And Romans 6, 6 says this. If you need a scripture, if you need all our holy warriors here, you need something to put in your armor. (laughs) Romans 6, 6 says this. We know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our lives. We are no longer slaves to sin. Come on. Say, no longer. No longer. Slaves to sin. Slaves to sin. I'm free. I'm free. So Jesus made the way for us to be free, but... This is something really important. I think we need to settle on this for just a few minutes because I, I feel like this was really the, the heart of what God yeah. wanted us to talk about is this idea that failure, sometimes we allow the devil to use our failures to define us, and God's saying, I'm overturning all of that, and he could overturn that all in a moment. Let me tell you why that's so important. When we look at the call, Romans eleven twenty nine, 29, for God's gift and call are irrevocable. That word irrevocable, we didn't define it yet. It means not able to be changed. Mm not able to be reversed, not able to be recovered. It is final. That means that whatever God says, it stands. And he has given you an invitation to a life abundant. He's given you an invitation to salvation. He's given you an invitation to a life of purpose where your life makes a difference in the world, where you can be a disciple of Jesus Christ who makes disciples of Jesus Christ. And so often the, the enemy wants to come in and say that failure now has disqualified you, but that's not the reality And I want to to emphasize something. God is not surprised by your failure. He's not sitting up in heaven thinking, oh, man, I didn't see that coming. He has a call and a promise on your life that was written before you were born. Look at Psalm 139, 16. It says, your eyes saw me before I was put together, and all the days of my life were written in your book before any of them came to be. What is that saying? That means that God saw your worst day long before you lived it. That means the day that I got the most drunk, the most hammered, the most inebriated I'd ever been in my life, the day that I hit that girl and ended up in jail and covered in my own vomit, that day God saw it and he still said, Mike, you're going to be a pastor. You're going to go preach the gospel. You're going to stand on the stage at the Wayworld Outreach and declare my goodness to people. Amen. He saw my worst day, and he still gave me the promise. Yes. You know, I think we see that in Paul's life. Paul, he's the author of like, what, almost half the New Testament? The guy's like the father of the New Testament church. He's preaching the gospel all over the world. He's teaching people about Jesus. But do you know how Paul started? As a murderer. Paul literally went from church to church, imprisoning, torturing, and killing Christians. And somehow in the middle of all that, I don't think anybody would have expected that Paul was going to become the leader of the New Testament church. In fact, when they found out that he was saved, they were like, what, Paul? You mean that guy that was killing people last week? Yeah, that same guy. The only person that wasn't surprised was God. God's like, I've had this in mind, baby. I've been planning this one. You didn't see that coming, did you, Satan? Look at Paul. Paul had this to say about his life. Galatians 1.15. But even before I was born, God chose me and called me by his marvelous grace. Paul knew the grace of God better than anybody. Yes. And he, he also said this, God's grace through Jesus is more than enough for every failure. Say more than enough. More than enough. Ephesians 4.7 says it this way. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Now, I love this verse. Let me unpack it to you for just a minute. This is saying that it's not about your failures. It's not about how big your failure is. And, and maybe you're, you're listening to Vanessa and I tell about some of our mistakes and our failures through the years, and you're saying, that's nothing. You got nothing on me. You don't know how many years I spent in prison. You don't know how many things I did that I still can't stop remembering. You don't know, Mike. Wow. But I'm telling you this. It has nothing to do with your failures. It has everything to do with what Jesus did on the cross, and the measure of his gift is big enough to cover every one of your failures, every one of your mistakes. 
not just yours, but your entire family, everyone in this room and all the world, they're covered by the measure of God's grace in Jesus Christ. Right, and I want to add something to that, that when we... Uh, when we believe the lie that your failures are too big or disqualifies you, what you're really saying is that God's grace isn't enough. Wow. That Jesus' blood isn't enough. Wow. And so what we need to do is we need to stop being so self-consumed, so focused on our failures, and fix our eyes on what Jesus did on the cross. Right. And and I, I I think that's so important. I know we're talking about failures, but this, like I said, I stayed in those lies for ten years. Wow. I'm not I'm not grown grown, but ten years is a long time. <laughs> and and I think about it. I was so excited about this message because I'm sitting there reflecting, think about thinking about my life and where I'm at. And my life, current life, is not a product of all the great decisions I've made. Cool. It's not a product of all the good things I've done. It's a product of God's love, his mercy, his grace, his kindness, mm. his forgiveness. Yeah. And so again, we just, we stop thinking about yourself. Right. <laughs> Get your eyes off yourself. Yeah. And I think that what happens though, and this is, this is true for all of us, is we get to these points where our shame and our guilt is just overwhelming. Yeah. And you're, maybe you're not sitting there saying, you know, you don't know nothing, but you are sitting there saying, you don't know what I've been through. You don't know what I did. You don't know how bad it really was, Mike. And the Bible has something so clear to say about this. In 1 John 3.20, it says, even if our hearts condemn us, even in another translation, even when shame condemns us, God is greater than our hearts and knows all things. So it's, again, it's pointing to this fact, guys, that it doesn't matter what your feelings say. It doesn't matter what your heart says. It doesn't matter what the enemy says because those things can be so loud that they'll drown out the most important voice that you need to hear tonight. And that's the voice of the Father saying, I've been waiting for this moment. I've been waiting for you to come. I've been waiting for you to say yes to this call, the call to salvation, the call to a life of abundance, the call to a life of purpose. The simple truth is that God doesn't see things the way that we do. Look at what God had to say about Abraham. I love this verse. It just blows my mind. So Abraham, the old, doubting, laughing out loud God who made so many mistakes and, and maybe even a failure. It says this in Romans 4.20, just a couple of verses down from where we were at in Romans. Abraham never wavered in believing God's promise. In fact, his faith grew stronger, and in this, he brought glory to God. How can that be true? We just shared with you the mistakes that Abraham made. We just shared with you the failures that Abraham had in his life. We just shared with you the fact that he literally laughed at God when the promise came. But when God's done writing the story of Abraham, he said this about Abraham. He never wavered. That's amazing to me. What is that telling me? It's saying that God doesn't see things the way that we do. How does he see them? He sees them through the lens of his son. He sees them through a sacrifice that was paid for every mistake, every failure you've ever committed. It has already been taken care of by Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter what happened last week. It doesn't matter what happened when you were 10 years old because God saw the end from the beginning and he made a way for you to be set free, to be washed, to walk in the grace and the calling that he's longed for you to live in. You didn't miss the call. He doesn't see your failures. He doesn't hold your doubts against you. And right now we're going to invite our altar team to come forward. And guys, my wife and I, we prayed, we fasted for this moment. And as I walked in the doors today, I saw an old friend that I've been longing to see. And I, I want you to know that, that God feels the same way about you. He's been longing to see you. He's been waiting for this moment where you would finally say, yes, God, I'm done letting the failure define my life. I'm done with all the doubts and the delays that have kept me from walking into the calling. I'm done with that. I want what you have for me. He's waiting for you to experience what I experienced. That night that someone read Jeremiah 29, 11, the, the plans for you are for your good, 
for your hope and for a future. And tonight, this is what it takes. It takes surrendering all those failures. It takes recognizing that they're there, they're real. There's real mistakes in Abraham's life. There's real mistakes in my life. There's real mistakes in Vanessa's life. We failed. Sometimes it felt like beyond repair. The Bible's clear that all of us have failed like that. Have you ever failed like that in your life? Have you ever sinned and known like there, this, is, this is not something I can make amends for? That's the condition every one of us in this room. And the, the cold part about it is that the only option for us if we stay there is to die. To be separated from God, to be separated from this call to an abundant, amazing life, to be separated from salvation because that is the consequence of sin, it says in Romans 6.23. But don't forget Romans 5.8, there's good news that while you were still in this state, and even before you were born, God saw the failures that were going to be in your life. He saw every mistake you were going to make. And he said, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to make a way. I'm going to send my son. It says in Romans 5, 8, that while we were still sinners, God demonstrated his love for us in this, that he sent his son to die, to pay the price that you and I owe for every failure, every doubting moment, every time we gave up so that we could be forgiven. And this is the best news of all, that all it takes is to say yes, to say, God, I want that call. I want to embrace salvation. Jesus, I want you to be the Lord of my life. I want to change. I want to surrender. I don't want to live the way that I've been living anymore. I'm ready to walk into the promise that you have for my life. So tonight, we're going to give you that opportunity. Don't walk out of here the way you walked in. Don't convince yourself you have a little bit more time, one more week. Well, it's not that bad. You know how bad it truly is. And I'll tell you this, if you walk out of here without saying yes tonight, it's only going to get worse. Tonight is your night. I don't believe it's an accident that on Valentine's Day 2024, you chose to come into this room. God has been waiting for this moment. He's been waiting for you to say yes. He's been waiting for you to say, I want what you have for me, God. I'm ready. So on the count of three, I want whoever it is in this room. You're saying, I'm, I'm done with the old life of sin. I'm done with failure. I'm done with those mistakes. I'm done with the doubt. I want Jesus. I want his plan. I want to be saved. I want you to raise your hand. One, two, three. Put those hands up. I see your hands. I see your hand. I see your hand, brother. This is your night. I see your hand. I'm so proud of you. I'm proud of you guys. I see those hands. I see your hand, sister. You're in the right place tonight. How about on this side? Let me see some hands over here. Come on, I know you called, you, you brought here for a moment. I see your hand. I see your hand. So right now, I want you to do one more thing for us. I want you to come down. I want you to walk to this altar, and I want you to tell God that you're done with the old way of life. I want you to commit today publicly before all of your friends and family in this room to say, I'm done with that old way of living. I'm going to walk with Jesus. Would you give them a round of applause? Would you clap for them? Would you get excited like heaven is right now? Let's all stand to our feet and celebrate these that are coming. We're so glad that you're coming. We're so glad that you're making this commitment. There's people here that are going to pray with you. They're going to help you on your next step. Some of you are saying, I've already been down to that altar. You need to come again. You need to make that commitment afresh. You know you've fallen away. You know you walked out the door and you didn't do what you were supposed to. Walk back down to this altar today and leave it at the foot of Jesus. Before anyone leaves, let's pray together. Before anyone leaves, please, just take a moment. This is an important moment. It's a moment for salvation for every single person at this altar. Church, do we have a few minutes more for those that are getting saved here today? Can we celebrate the lives that are being changed right here at this altar? I want you all to pray with me. Everybody in this room and those at the altar, I want you to pray this prayer with me. And then these here at the altar are going to help you. They're going to get you on your next step. You'll be starting at the way this Sunday. You can get baptized. You can learn about why that's so important. And then you can join Holy Warriors on the 27th and really get ready 
for a brand new life. But right now we're going to just pray a prayer of surrender, just like I did, whatever, how many years ago it was. But let's pray this. Jesus, I surrender my life to you. I'm done with my way of living. I want your plan. I want your future. I want to live the life you want for me. Help me to leave the sin behind. Wash me clean today so that I can be a brand new person and I can live the life that you want. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you give all these a one more round of applause? Celebrate what God is doing.